Eureka by John Thomas, Volume 1 Chapter 2, Section 2, Part 5 The Diabolos Fear not the things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the Diabolos will cast of you into prison, that ye may be tempted. Verse 10 The saints in Smyrna were not strangers to tribulation. For where the gospel of the kingdom was believed and obeyed for remission of sins and the hope of a resurrection from among the dead, to inherit that kingdom with the glory of the millennial aeon or olam, tribulation of some sort, from Jew or Greek or from both, was sure to follow, as it does even in this day of so-called liberty and light. For all the apostles, in word and example, testified that it is through much tribulation we must enter the kingdom of the deity. Acts 14, verse 22 But their works, which were righteous, being manifest in the presence of the Satan and of the Diabolos, would be sure to bring upon them frequent renewals of their malignant and dangerous attacks. The repudiation of the Satan's claims to the Christian name secured to them the enmity of their synagogue, whose members are scandalized at an earnest and uncompromising contention for the faith as originally delivered to the saints by the apostles, Jude 3. They call this uncharitable, and calculated to do harm, and to drive off respectable people from the truth, who but for the ultraism of Antipas, which destroys the popularity and endangers the position of all connected with him, would embrace the truth, swell the number of its adherents, and make it respected, if not esteemed, by the wealthy and honourable of the world. This has been the Satan's desire, from the beginning until now. They are not so much opposed to the truth as an abstraction, but the consequences of a bold, straightforward, and uncompromising statement and advocacy of it, they hate and detest with unmitigated bitterness and disgust. This state of mind and policy with respect to the truth on the part of the Satan's synagogue of all Christendom establishes and develops enmity between the seed of the woman or true apocalyptic Jews, that is, Christians, and the seed of the serpent, or real apocalyptic liars, who say they are Jews or Christians, and are not, but do lie. This enmity subsisting between true and spurious Christians caused the Satanists to betray the others, as Jesus foretold they would in Matthew 24 verse 10. But then, to whom should the Satan betray the saints of the Ecclesias? This letter to the Smyrnians answers to Ho Diabolos, to the Diabolos, vulgarly styled the Devil. As it is written, Behold, the Diabolos will cast of you into prison, that ye may be tempted. But to what sort of a devil is this that the saints were to be betrayed? A devil that could apprehend flesh and blood men and incarcerate them alive in prison? Was it the immortal, fireproof, orthodox devil with horns, hoofs, forked tongue and arrow-headed tail, redolent of brimstone and armed with pitchfork, 
who arrested the saints and imprisoned them in the jails of the Asia Minor. Is it this, his Suti Majesty, to whom the jails and penitentiaries of Christendom belong? If so, how comes he to admit the clergy to these precincts to convert his prisoners, and to offer them the consolations of their religions, unless they are his particular friends and confidants? Would he imprison saints on account of the faith, and appoint reverend and holy divines, genuine Christian men, to be the chaplains of his jails? Or would true and genuine believers, real ambassadors of Jesus Christ, and unsophisticated successors of the apostles, condescend or defile themselves, become such traitors to him who had purchased them with his blood, as to accept office under so hideous and monstrous a devil? Must there not be an amicable compact, some treaty of peace, friendship and alliance between the clergy and the devil, seeing that they are in official service under him, and that he pays them salaries for indoctrinating his jail birds and spiritualizing his legislators and the soldiers and sailors of his armies and marines. The prisons of the world and the police of the world and the executioners of the world manifestly belong to the devil. This is proved by the text before us, which testifies that the devil casts into prison. Now in order to do this, the magistrates must be in his service, or they would not issue orders of arrest at his dictation. The police also must be in his service, or they would not serve the warrants, and the jailers and lictors, or they would not put the saints in ward, or carry them to death. All these things, therefore, are the devils, whoever or whatever he may be. What then do we see? We see the clergy, his willing and official tools. We see them serving him for the honour and wages emanating from the high places of his kingdom. They are in the world's pay, which they admit belongs to the god of the world, whom they call the devil. Therefore the conclusion is necessary and inevitable, that they are the devils, and the work of the devil they do. This being the case, it is not difficult to understand how it is that the clergy are the chaplains of all the devil's institutions. He claims the bodies and souls of the people whom he has ensnared, having been taken captive by him at his will. 2 Timothy 2 verse 26 He has found it, therefore, to his interest since the truth was promulgated in his dominions by the apostles, to set up a counteracting system, which under the name of Christianity should nullify or neutralise the thing. This the Satan, who set up his synagogue, or holy apostolic Catholic Church, upon the foundation of the mystery of iniquity, were ready to do, having entered into a holy alliance under the style of the old serpent, the devil, and Satan, a form renowned for its unprincipled transactions throughout the world. The devil appointed the Lord's spiritual, the right reverend, most reverend, very reverend, and reverend divines of the synagogue of the Satan, 
to take care of the unclean and hateful birds. Revelation 18 verse 2 He had ensnared in their last moments. Ignorantly supposing it possible that having served him loyally all their days, they might escape him at last. But the devil is by nature and education very ignorant of the truth and very superstitious. And as the clergy live and flourish by his folly and stupidity, they are not solicitous for his enlightenment. At all events, that he should not become more intelligent in scripture than themselves. Hence they are careful to flatter him and to pander to his superstition, so that wherever folly is to be transacted in the name of religion, there the devil finds on hand gentlemen of the cloth, ready to perform it in tone, grimace, and full canonicals to suit. For who but the devil's own could attend a murderer to the gallows with the consolations of religion, in view of the divine testimony that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him? 1 John 3 verse 15 Who but one of the children of the devil could kidnap a little Jew boy and sprinkle him with a few drops of water and proclaim him to be a Christian, in view of Paul's testimony that without faith it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11 verse 6 Who but one of the devil's own counsellors could preach a sermon over a deceased scoundrel, affirming that his immortal soul was then in glory beyond the skies, in view of the declaration that the soul that sinneth it shall die. Who but one of the devil's own priests could promise salvation to man or woman upon other terms than those contained in the wholesome words of the Lord Jesus, who hath said, He that believeth the gospel of the kingdom and is immersed shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be condemned. Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, and Matthew 24, verse 14. All these abominations, and a multitude besides, the clergy do. In short, their teaching and practices are all approved by the world and the pietism of the flesh. And therefore there is but one scriptural conclusion that can be arrived at namely that they are of the devil, devilish and condemned. But in regard to their patron and father, the devil, we may profitably inquire, is he the hideous and sooty monster generally supposed by the disciples of his divines? Or is he altogether something else? I answer that all that can be known about the devil is revealed in the scriptures, and that in these writings there is no such devil exhibited as is preached by the clergy and believed in by the world. The clerical devil is the devil of heathenism, introduced into the synagogue of the Satan by the apocalyptic liars. They introduced him into their theology as the great terror of their system, which was designed to work upon the fears rather than upon the admiration and nobler affections of mankind. The old heathen devil and an eternal hell of fire and brimstone have been the basis of the clerical gospel from that day to this. They had abandoned the goodness of the deity, and consequently could no longer make use of it to lead men to repentance, or change of mind and disposition 
Romans 2 verse 4. They had, therefore, to introduce another agent. And, as the clerical system of doctrine is merely heathenism in a new dress, they adopted the old god Pluto, tricked out with the appendages of another called Pan. These heathen deities combined in one they call the devil, surrounded by all the furies of Tartarus, of horrid shapes and appalling aspects, they exhibit to their dupes as the devil's officials in the regions of the damned, waiting to clutch their immortal souls in the article of dissolution, unless they repent of their sins and become members of the clerical communion, thus making the devil an effectual co-labourer in bringing men under the influence of the clergy. Separate the devil and his adjuncts from their system, and their occupation would be gone. For apart from hell and the devil, the clergy have no power to excite the mind. But while we repudiate the clergyman's devil as a mere phantasma of disordered brains, we by no means deny the existence of what is styled diabolos in the scriptures. Our proposition at this point is that the devil of the clergy is not the diabolos of scripture. This is easy to be seen by taking their representation of the devil as the definition of the word and trying to expound the scriptures in which devil is mentioned thereby. Take, for instance, Hebrews 2 verse 14, where it is written, Therefore, for as much as the children, given of the deity to the son for brethren, partook of flesh and blood, he also himself in like manner shared in the same, that through the death he accomplished, he might destroy that having the power of death, that is, the diabolos. Now, Paul elsewhere informs us that Jesus was crucified through weakness. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 4 And the clergy teach that their diabolos, or devil, is second only to their trinity in power. Almost, if not quite, omnipotent. At all events, powerful enough to hold in eternal captivity and torture the vast majority of the human beings God has made. He either holds them with God's consent or against it. If he hold them with it, God and the devil are made co-partners, and God is made by their traditions to have created an enormous multitude of men, women and children for no other destiny than eternal torments, which gives the lie to the scriptures, which teach that God is love. If the devil hold the damned against God's consent, then the devil is more powerful than God. But the clergy are unwilling to accept the consequences of their own theories. They would not like to admit the co-partnership nor the superior strength of their devil, though upon their premises one or the other is unavoidable. They will admit, however, that their father and patron, the devil, is vastly powerful. This is admission enough to illustrate the incompatibility of their traditions with scripture. Thus, how comes it that the spirit laid hold upon death-stricken and corruptible flesh and blood, which is so weak and frail, called the seed of Abraham, that through its death he might destroy so mighty and powerful a devil? 
would it not have been more accordant with the requirements of the case for him to have combated with him unencumbered with flesh or in the spirit nature of angels became weak and dead to destroy the mighty and the living when the creator of the devil could with a word annihilate him but there is as little reason as scripture in the depths of satan as the clergy teach and therefore it would be mere waste of time and space to occupy ourselves any further with their speculations and traditions upon this subject the spirit clothed himself with weakness and corruption in other words sins flesh's identity that he might destroy the diabolos it is manifest from this the diabolos must be of the same nature as that which the spirit assumed for the supposition that he assumed human nature to destroy a being of angelic nature or of some other more powerful is palpably absurd the diabolos is something then pertaining to flesh and blood and the spirit or logos became flesh and blood to destroy it now whatever flesh and blood thing it may be paul says that it hath the power of death that is it is the power which causes mankind to die if then we can ascertain from paul what is the power or cause of death we discover what the thing is he terms the diabolos for he tells us that the diabolos has the power of death well then referring to hosea 13 verse 14 where the spirit saith i will ransom them from the power of the grave paul exclaims in view of this deliverance as the result of a price paid o death where is thy sting o hades sheol or grave where is thy victory the power of a venomous serpent to produce death lies in its sting therefore paul uses sting as equivalent to power hence his inquiry is o death where is thy power this question he answers by saying the sting or power of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law that the power of death is sin he illustrates in his argument contained in his letter to the saints in rome in romans 5 verse 12 he says death by sin he does not say by the devil sin entered into the world if he had this would have given the devil existence before sin but he says by one man or adam sin entered into the world this agrees with moses who tells us that there was a time after the creation was finished when there was nothing in the world but what was very good and elohim saw all that he the spirit had made and behold it was very good genesis 1 verse 31 man is therefore older than sin and consequently older than the diabolos man introduced it into the world and not an immortal devil nor god neither god then nor such a devil was the author of sin but the authorship was constituted of the sophistry of the serpent believed and experimented by the man 
male and female. Man, then, having introduced sin, death entered into the world by sin, and so death passed upon all men to condemnation. For by one man's disobedience the many were constituted sinners, and the wages of sin is death to those who obey it. Romans 5, verses 12, 18 and 19, and 6, verses 23 and 16. But though constituted sinners in Adam, if no law had been given after his transgression, his posterity would not have known when they did right or wrong. For Paul says, I had not known sin, but by the law. The law is, therefore, the strength of sin. Sin reigns by the holy, just, and good law, through the weakness of the flesh. Romans 7, verses 7 and 12, and 8, verse 3. Where there is no law, there is no sin, for sin is the transgression of law, so that without the law, sin is dead. Chapter 7, verse 8, and 1 John 3, verse 4. This shows how inherently bad flesh is in its thoughts and actions, that a good thing should stir it up to wickedness. Its lusts and affections are impatient of control. Paul therefore said, In me, that is, in my flesh, dwells no good thing. When this, which is utterly destitute of any good thing, is placed under a good law, scope is afforded it to display itself in all its natural deformity, and to prove that, the law of its nature is not the law of God, but the law of sin and death. Thus, the introduction of a good law, demanding obedience of that which has nothing good in it, is the occasion of sin abounding in the world. Chapter 5, verse 20. And thereby evinces its enormity, and shows that Sin is an exceedingly great sinner. Kath upe bolain hamatolos. Chapter 7, verse 13. In this expression, Paul personifies sin and says that it deceived him, slew him, and worked death in him. Sin is a word in Paul's argument which stands for human nature with its affections and desires. Hence, to become sin or for one to be made sin for others, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, is to become flesh and blood. This is called sin or sin's flesh because it is what it is in consequence of sin or transgression. When the dust of the ground was formed into a body of life or living soul, or as Paul terms it, a physical or natural body, it was a very good animal creation. It was not a pneumatic or spirit body, Indeed, for it would then have been immortal and incorruptible, and could neither have sinned nor have become subject to death. But for an animal or natural body, it was very good, and capable of an existence free from evil, as long as its probationary aeon or period might continue. If that period had been fixed for a thousand years, and man had continued obedient to law 
all that time. His flesh and blood nature would have experienced no evil, and at the end of that long day he might have been permitted to eat of the tree of the lives, by which eating he would have been changed in the twinkling of an eye into a spirit body, which is incorruptible, glorious, and powerful. And he would have been living at this day, but man transgressed. He listened to the sophistry of flesh, reasoning under the inspiration of its own instincts. He gave heed to this, the thinking of the flesh, or carnal mind, which is enmity against God, is not subject to his law, neither indeed can be. The desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, and the pride of life, which pertain essentially to all living human or ground souls, were stirred up by what he saw and heard, and he was drawn away of his own lust and enticed. His lust having conceived, it brought forth sin in intention, and this being perfected in action, caused death to ensue. James 1 verse 13 Every man, says the Apostle, is tempted in this way. It is not God, nor the clerical devil, that tempts man, but his own lust, excited by what from without addresses itself to his five senses, which always respond approvingly to what is agreeable to them. Seeing that man had become a transgressor of the divine law, there was no need of a miracle for the infliction of death. All that was necessary was to prevent him from eating of the tree of lives, and to leave his flesh and blood nature to the operation of the laws peculiar to it. It was not a nature formed for interminable existence. It was very good, so long as in healthy being. But immortality and incorruptibility were no part of its goodness. These are attributes of a higher and different kind of body. The animal or natural body may be transformed into a deathless and incorruptible body, but without that transformation it must of necessity perish. This perishing body is sin, and left to perish because of sin. Sin, in its application to the body, stands for all its constituents and laws. The power of death is in its very constitution, so that the law of its nature is styled the law of sin and death. In the combination of the elements of the law, the power of death resides, so that to destroy that having the power of death is to abolish this physical law of sin and death, and instead thereof to substitute the physical law of the spirit of life, by which the same body would be changed in its constitution and live forever.